When I was flipping bikes, I would have three different levels of flip. I had a legal flip, I had a safe flip, and I had a good flip. When my brother-in-law just got the CBR 1000, he came to me and said, can you help me look it over? I said, well, what level do you want? He goes, I want it to be safe. So let's talk about that for a bit. Let's go through the top 10 things that I would look at to make sure this bike is safe for the road as a new used bike purchase. This bike sure is shiny, looks good, sounds good, runs strong. But was it a good buy? I've noticed that there was a gap on YouTube of people that have all these videos out there saying how to find the best used bike. But what about when you get the bike home? What do you need to look for to make sure that you are safe on the road? The first thing we're gonna look at today is the tires. The condition of the tires, the pressures, and the wear. So this tire has some decent tread to it. It's pretty deep tread. Looks like it's in good shape but I wanna make sure it's not too old. Even though it looks good, it might be too old. So let's find the manufacturer date. So if you look around the tire, you'll see it says DOT and then a series of numbers after it. The last four digits tell you what date it was made. It was the 17th week of 2021. Now it's currently 2023, so I'd say this tire is probably pretty decent. The fact that it's only two years old. Let's check the front tire, make sure it's the same, or at least similar. So the DOT stamp on this one says it is the third week of 2021, also good to go. When looking at the tire condition, you wanna look at the roundness of the tire too. Especially in places like Texas where you're on a lot of flat straight roads, you sometimes get a flat spot on the tire itself. So having a nice round shape is something worth looking at. The tire pressures are also crucial. The tire pressures help make sure that the tire wears properly and that you get good grip. Tire pressures vary by manufacturer. This is a Dunlop tire. I'd highly recommend checking out your manufacturer's website to see what the suggested pressures are, but the manufacturer of the motorcycle also tells you what the pressure should be. On this little sticker here, it says that the front tire should be 36 PSI and the rear tire is 42 PSI. Similar to the rear tire, we wanna make sure that the front tire is round and doesn't have any weird bumps to it. When the pressures are off or the suspension is off, you'll get something called a cupping where there's like ridges in the tire. You can rub your hand along the tire here and you'll feel if there's any cupping. This one feels pretty good. So I think that's probably a good sign that these tires are good to go once we get more pressure in them. A very important part of a motorcycle, any kind of motorcycle, is getting the power from the engine to the wheel. So the chain and the sprockets are super crucial to make sure that they are safe and they are assembled properly. Chains will stretch out as they get older you get more slack in it, and then you can actually adjust them with these adjuster bolts right here. You loosen up the axle nut, and then you can take this and push this back to adjust the, the chain tension. For most bikes, you want about two finger widths at the wheel for the chain. And you can see here, this chain has over three finger lengths, th finger widths. This chain is too loose. I'm gonna make sure we tighten that. We also wanna look at the alignment of the chain. But as you're looking down, you can see if the chain has a bit of a wobble to it. You wanna make sure that the, the chain is nice and straight. While I was doing that, I noticed something else about this chain. This is a 530 chain on a 1000cc sport bike. The previous owner installed this chain with a master link clip. I do not recommend these types of clip links for this powerful of a bike. It's a lot of power going to the chain that runs the risk of this link failing and that could be catastrophic. It's worth checking the wheel bearings too because bearings do go bad. This bike isn't that old, but it's a good idea just to hold the swing arm and the wheel and you can rock it back and forth. If there's any movement or clicking, you'd replace the wheel bearings. The next thing we're gonna look at is actually the brake pads, but I wanna show you this too because as I'm taking this off to see the brake pads, I noticed another issue. This is the license plate. Random things you might not think to look at. This bracket is completely broken. So runs the risk of this snapping off while riding and the license plate going flying and then you're out the money to have to replace your license plate. So take a look at random things like this when you get a bike, make sure it's safe. I'm gonna replace this, that way we don't have to worry about the plate flying off. So when looking at the brake pads, there's a few things that you really wanna look at. You wanna to look to see if there's any real wear or scratches on the rotor itself. This is the rotor here. You can take your finger and you can run your finger on it and see if there's any grooves or cuts. This one feels nice and smooth. But when looking at the brake pads, when looking at the brake pads, you wanna make sure that there's enough material here that you can see it 
if that's super thin and not the same width as the metal piece of the pad, probably a good idea just to replace them. And while we're down here, we want to also look at the caliper piston. It's this part right here. If you can see that it's dirty and grimy and gross, it's worth taking the caliper apart and trying to clean that up so that that can slide in and out and the brakes work effectively. Now let's look at the front brake pads. So the front brake pads you can see a little bit easier. Don't have to remove anything in most cases. But you want to look right in here to see if you can see a decent amount of material on the pads themselves too. Let's also do the brake rotor test, see if there's any grooves. There's a bit of a rippling, but it's not terrible. You can see that there is a slight discoloration too. I don't know if it's coming across in the camera, but see that dark line right there? That makes me want to take the brake pads off, scour them, clean them, make sure that they're nice and safe because there might be a bit of a piece of dirt or something stuck on the pad causing that to burn the rotor. I'd like to add that I'm not doing the services on the bike right now. This is just a checklist of things to look at, things to potentially do with servicing. I might put together some videos of this CBR as I'm working on it, but if you have any specific questions about the types of services, let me know. I'll see if I can throw some videos together for you guys to help you out. All right, the number four thing is brake fluid. Now, obviously we have front brakes and we have back brakes, which means we have two master cylinders to push the fluid. Your rear master cylinder is typically somewhere close to your rear brake. But what you're looking for is whether or not you have enough fluid or if it's discolored. This rear master cylinder, for example, you can't really see it, so I like to grab a flashlight. Hopefully that shows up in the video. There we go. You can see that line is really low. That means if you were to lean this bike to the left, you might potentially get a bubble in your brake line and that caused some issues. So we're gonna fill this up to the proper amount. There are two separate indicators here. One says lower, one says upper. You really want your brake fluid line to be between those two when the bike is level. The front master cylinder has a diaphragm inside of it that prevents any air from getting in. It also keeps it from sloshing around when you're leaning the bike. So it makes it a little bit harder to see where the fluid level is. So again, the flashlight comes in handy. On this bike, you can see this is completely full. That is good. It's also yellow. That's a good sign. As brake fluid gets older, it turns darker, kind of like engine oil does. So if you were to do this and the fluid be like a dark honey color, that's time to replace. You do not need a lift to do any of these things. You do not need expensive tools to look over the bike and make sure it's safe to ride. Just a basic mechanics tool set is really all you need. I will say having a rear stand is very, very helpful to help keep the bike vertical. That way you can check things like the brake fluid, like the oil, the tires. You can roll the tire around and not have to worry about having to push the bike everywhere you go. So a rear stand is very, very useful. I'll try to find one on Amazon that I like and link that below. I use pit bull stands. I've been using them for years. They're a bit expensive, but totally worth it if you have the budget. Depending on what kind of bike, where you live and how the bike is ridden, your oil needs to be changed at different intervals. Please check with your owner's manual to make sure you have the right interval to change your oil. But when I get a used bike, if it's new to me, I like to change the oil and the filter just to start from scratch and know when it was changed and know where to start that cycle from so I can be safe with all my oil changes. Even if the previous owner said fresh oil change, you never know what they put in there. You don't know if it's a good oil, you don't know if it's a good filter, or if they're even telling the truth. So I always like to change the oil and filter when I get a new bike. Something that's a good idea to check before you buy the bike, but also a good idea once you first get the bike home is the oil level. So again, you want the bike to be vertical. It can't be on the side stand. Different bikes have different windows. This one has a nice window you can see through the fairings. There is actually a high line and a low line there, but that oil is completely full. I'm gonna drain this oil out, put fresh oil in it, the correct amount, and a new filter too. Make sure it's safe. So I'm at a point where I wanna take all the plastics off. That way I can check things like the air filter, I can check all the electrical components, the battery, everything. So let's get into that. While taking this apart, I'm noticing that a lot of the bolts are missing or the wrong size or different sizes across the bike. So I picked up a fairing bolt kit. This will help that when I put it back together, I know make sure that I don't need to bounce between tools. I know what's going where, when, and how, and just makes it easier to work on in the future. Highly recommend getting a bolt kit, or if you have access to a series of bolts, replace them as you need to, but consistent bolts are very helpful. And keep in mind, if you've got a Japanese bike, 
They're all metric bolts. Please don't put SAE bolts in there. It'll just mess up your future owner. Not a good day. If it's your first time taking panels off, don't just pull things. There's a push pin that's stuck, so I need to get a tool to pull that out. So I got the side panel off and check this out. It's no wonder the turret signals didn't work. They just cut them. Straight cut them. On this CBR1000, there's a couple bolts, one on either side, that hold the tank into the frame. When you take those bolts out, there's a pivot point. You can rotate this back and hold it up with a strap. That way you can gain access to the air box. The air box sits on top of the engine. Basically what the air box does is it sucks in air as the bike is moving, filters it, and puts it into the tops of the throttle bodies. So there's a filter in here. I want to take these screws out, pull the cover off, and look at the filter. So on these filters, the air comes in and then goes out. So if you're looking at the outside, you wouldn't see that it's dirty. You'd have to look on the inside to see how dirty it actually is. What I'm doing with the air filter now is looking at all the fins. I'm actually seeing a bunch of sand inside the fins. So my recommendation is to buy new air filters, start from scratch, make sure you've got good filters in this that way we know what's going on inside of the air box. While we're looking at the brakes, like the pads and the calipers, we can also look at the brake lines, make sure there's no cracks in the lines, that there's no leaks, that they're just sound and safe. We can also look at the controls while we're up there too, so let's have a look at the controls too. When looking at the brake components, there are a lot of rubber pieces. Most of the lines from the factory are rubber, and then a lot of the seals inside of the calipers are rubber too. So we're gonna look at the hoses, make sure they're not dry, make sure they're not cracked, look at the banjo bolts to see if there's any evidence of leaking on either the caliper or the master cylinder. We wanna look at the seals, Make sure there's no drips or dribbles or cracks on those too. When looking at the front brake, because you obviously have a lever, we wanna make sure that the lever returns properly and it doesn't get stuck back. We wanna look at the master cylinder lines again, the brake lines up here, see if there's any leaks. Just poke around, see if you can find any reason, reason to believe that you wanna replace those lines. We also wanna to check to make sure that the brakes work effectively, that you don't have the lever go all the way back to the bar. If it goes all the way back to the bar, there might be air in the system and you have to bleed it out. This is also the time I like to look at the throttle cables. In most modern bikes, you have two cables. You have a push and a pull. So when you twist the throttle, it should snap back. If it doesn't, you have access on cruise control. So there's reason to believe that we should look at these lines. It could be a fray. It could be that just there's something stuck in the throttle. But this is a big concern for me. We're going to make sure that it snaps back. If this is your first bike and your first time going over any type of mechanical thing like this, and you get to a point where you don't feel comfortable, please take it to a mechanic. Please take it to a shop that has been through this before. There are things on motorcycles that if not done correctly could be very bad for you or for the bike. For example, that throttle. If the throttle sticks open and you can't fix it, that is very dangerous. Make sure your bike is safe. That's why we're putting together this list for you so that you know what to look for. And again, if you get to a point where you're not comfortable, take it to a shop, please. The number eight thing on our list is one of people's least favorite things to do, track down electrical gremlins. We wanna look at the electrical components of the bike, make sure they all work. We're looking at turn signals, headlights, brake lights, charging system, battery condition, all things like that. The first thing I wanna look at is the voltage of the battery itself to make sure that it's putting out at least 12 volts, just the stationary. Using the voltmeter, I can check to see we're at about 12.4, 12.5 volts. That's a good indication that this is at least holding a charge, but what I don't know is, is this is holding enough amperage to start the bike. We do see evidence that they replaced the stator and the voltage regulator, so my guess is there was a charging system issue before when they replaced those. Hopefully they replaced the battery too. The way to check that is to check the voltage drop when starting the bike. So, put the leads back on, turn the key, See that there's a little drop to 11.8. That's not bad. Let's see what happens when we start the bike. It dropped to about 10.5 and then right back up to 12 and a half once the bike started. That's a good sign. I'll check the charging to see if at revs it'll go higher, but I've got my garage door shut right now because it's so hot outside. So I'll do that at a later time. When checking the electrical components, you don't necessarily have to take all the bodywork off, but when you do, you can find things 
like random wires that are spliced or cut, that means that you should track down why it's like that, what might be disabled if there's wires that are cut. So I'm gonna go ahead and just turn the key, make sure that the gauges turn on properly, there's no check engine lights, there's no flashings or indications of an issue or an error. I see that the FI light comes on, that's fine, that usually happens before you start the bike. But I wanna look at things like turn signals. So when I go to the right turn signal, the right turn signal flashes. I know that the wires were cut in the front, but let's check the back. We've got the right turn signal working correctly in the integrated tail. Let's check the left. So I'll cancel that, go left. Notice that? I don't know if you can see it in the, the, the gauges there, but it is uh, not wanting to actually stay activated. I can feel that there's a bit of a tension in this switch here. So that means I wanna take a look at the contacts in this, make sure that we can get that fixed and operating properly so that the signals work properly. We're gonna check the high beams and the low beams. My brother who owns this bike said he's been riding with the high beams on. You can see that the high beam signal is indicated on the gauge. If I go to the low beam, the lights turn off. Neither of the front headlights work. So I'm gonna look at the wiring on the headlight bulbs themselves, see if the bulbs are bad, see if the wiring's bad try to trace that down and figure out what's causing those low beams not to work. Item number nine on our list that we're gonna check is our suspension components. We have two forks in the front, one shock in the rear on most bikes. Some cruisers you'll see two shocks in the rear, but generally speaking, we're looking at the front and the rear. On many sport bikes, you can't see a whole lot of the rear shock. It's kind of between the subframe and the swing arm, but what we're looking for is any signs of oil basically because these are filled with oil there are springs in them there's the oil that goes inside of the canisters themselves so we're going to look at the bottom and see if there's any residue or if there's any dripping any reason to believe that there'd be a leak in the rear shock now when looking at this bike obviously it looks lowered from a body standpoint but we see there's adjustable shock linkage here so you can change the ride height of the bike but i also see that these are very dirty and look potentially dry. So there's a chance that the bearings themselves are worn out. So that's something worth looking at as well. I wanna to check to see if there's any weird noises on the suspension. So while it's on the stand, I'm gonna bounce up and down to see if I hear any squeaking in the bearings. I don't, so that means those bearings are probably okay. We also wanna look at the front forks. If you see any types of scratching or striations or leaks, you'll sometimes see oil down here on the bottom of the fork tubes. Those are indications of a leaky fork seal. I don't see that on this bike, but let me check the other side too. So on the left-hand side, I do see a bit of residual oil. Um, there might be an indication of there being a leaky fork seal on this side. So that's something I can dig into a little bit deeper. I don't see a large amount of oil, so it's probably not leaking too terribly. It might just be a little bit of dirt stuck inside the seal itself. A simple suggestion for suspension is to find the owner's manual online or the service manual, find the stock settings for the adjustability, especially on sport bikes. You've got things like compression, preload, and rebound. Those all have suggested settings. So I kind of touched on this before. It might sound like it's cosmetic, but having the right bolts in the right places makes a big difference. This bike was missing some bolts in the fairings that could potentially fly off or get stuck on something when you're riding. Definitely need to have bolts where they should be to keep the bike safe. So that's number 10 in our list is look through the fairings, look through all the spots that should have bolts, make sure you have them. We don't want anything falling off of the bike while you're riding it. So do a good look over, touch everything on the bike, make sure it's tight, it's not gonna just wiggle around and rattle itself out. It's definitely key. If you don't want to or you can't afford to, you don't need to get a bolt kit necessarily, but at least make sure things don't wiggle. Like these mirrors are on, their bolts are there, but they're both fairly loose. So we need to go around and just tighten everything down. There were some of the, the fairing bolts that were missing, clips on the trim pieces like this. We just need to make sure that's all in the right place and it's gonna stay intact while riding. Hopefully this list of 10 things was useful to you when you first get your used bike. Wanna make sure that you're safe out there. Please remember three things in this journey. Be nice to fellow riders, ride more, and stay safe. Thanks everyone, see you in the next one.